Hello everyone, and welcome to what is probably my fifth recording of this particular video. And it's taken so long to record because, honestly, I've had to make my mind up about a few things. Those things, mainly, have been what really the Capitani Romani class were. What they were. And so, in the time for recording, things have changed. There is something above my head, for starters. But, I've not got Iron Brew, which is annoying, but not impossible to deal with. I have got myself some ice cream. Because, apparently, and this is according to the lovely person at my local corner shop, when one is dealing with a moment, um, a mentor's occasion, like coming to the end of something which might make you both cry and happy, ice cream is the perfect solution. So that is what I have. The ice cream is, um, well, hagen -Dazs. Unfortunately, Ben and Jerry's was busy. So, the Captani Romani class. What are their good points? What are their bad points? Good points? They're excellent small cruisers. Bad points? They are pretty much large destroyers. I have often used the phrase that if tribal class destroyers are cruisers in destroyer form, then Dido class cruisers are cruisers, uh, well, cruisers in destroyer form. And that very much describes them. But in the Capitani Romani class, it's basically, we're building large destroyers. In every way, shape you can possibly imagine, they are supersized destroyers. They are some of the smallest cruisers built in the interwar period, displacing 3,745 tons in standard, 5,420 tons fully loaded. They, in the post-World War II period, will actually be classified as destroyers. And this reflects them in so many ways. But mostly these ships are a reflection of what is going on in the Mediterranean in the late 1930s. So what is going on in the Mediterranean in the late 1930s? Well, a lot. This is the Mediterranean a la 1939, 1930, 1939. And you can see the basis. Now, at this point, France and Italy are engaging in a speed race. Who can build the fastest ship? Now, on one side, you have the Condottore. On the other side, you have the Contratorpelias. Both sides are equally fun and equally, in many ways, unbalanced ships. This doesn't go away. This continues. This is part of them. It's part of what they've baked into the scenario because both navies seem to be willfully ignoring the fact that aircraft exist. And actually building a ship which is built for speed is a great idea. Apart from when you're realising that they're never going to be able to outrun the things. Now, the Capitani Romani class originally start as Exploratory Oceanic. Or rather, Ocean Scouts before they become Kashika Condottori, flotilla leaders, lighter Condottori class vessels, lighter Condottori. <sighs> if you could build something any lighter than the Condottori and actually call it a light cruiser. Mm -mm. But the thing is, that's what they are. Mm. 
their machinery would develop 110,000 shaft horsepower, giving them top speed of 41 knots. That is a lot of power, and that is a lot of speed. It's still not going to outrun aircraft. So how did this come about? How had the world got to a point where they were chasing this sort of speed? And why? Why had they got to this point? Well, there are multiple reasons. Firstly, there is the fact that, realistically, aircraft are good and developing quickly, but they're not there yet. Secondly, you're dealing with a service which doesn't have control of its air arm at all, doesn't have control of any aircraft in terms of the Regia Marina and the Italian fleet. And the Marine Nationale has somewhat control of its aircraft, but it has the burn, which has sort of given it a, an interesting view on naval aviation. And then you've got this. The French get into a race with the Italian cruisers. So you have the Condottori coming out and you have the French fast destroyers, the Contra Torpilliers. Now the thing is, at a certain point, the Italians realise how weak the Condottori are versus these vessels. These vessels... are very much capable of taking them out. And if you want proof of that, you just look after look into World War II and see how many of the Condottori were taken out by tribal class destroyers, which were the Royal Navy equivalents. They weren't built to be as fast as La Fantastico Morgro. They weren't. But they were built to be mighty nasty. And they had a lot of firepower. And they had a lot of capabilities. And... These ships didn't need armour because they were designed to be produced in numbers. And you have six of the Lanta Fantastique class and two of the Mogador class. And that makes sense because destroyers are more of a number asset than cruisers. What do I mean by this? Today... Almost every warship you see, every warship we talk about, is not a numbers asset. It is an individual asset. It is something we think about as a unit. To be honest, the British, when looking at these ships, didn't consider it a class until they had all eight. Oh, then you now, now you have a flotilla of them. Kodak, you don't have a flotilla. Flotilla is eight destroyers. A destroyer is considered valuable once it's formed up into its flotilla. Yes, in wartime, the flotillas shrink to four ships because that's what they need. The bare minimum. Yes, eight is better, but they shrink down to four, so you can have multiple flotillas in multiple positions. It also allows you to recognise the skills of commanders far better and have shrunken command structures which allow you to have in way, many ways more survivability of command. All these things are useful. But still, if you were thinking about sending an individual ship, you would be thinking about sending a cruiser, not a destroyer. And here are the Condottoris. You are about as small and lightly armoured and uh, armoured as you can build a cruiser, really, and still consider it fit for independent operations. And they don't do well. They do very well. Certain members of the cl uh, certain groups of the ships, basically the latter Condottori are far far better as we've been over before in discussing them than the for uh, the original Condottori, but they have capabilities. And they are viable ships, even if their viability is based upon speed. As such, 
we do consider them cruisers. If we look at the Contratorpelias, they are powerful destroyers, but no one's going to make the case of them being cruiser vessels. They're not like the tribals in that regard. They are using the destroyer leader allowance, but they are not destroyer. They are not going in the same way as the British were going. If we look at these, the Italians have built, well, high speed, very capable cruisers which are designed to sally out, attack merchant convoys wherever they can, and go back. And remember, if you're Italy, if you are France, where are you thinking about fighting? You're thinking about fighting in the Western Mediterranean. Eastern Mediterranean is where the Royal Navy lies. That's not the French problem. It is the Italian problem, but again, the Eastern Mediterranean is a long way, and you have to deal with significant assets to get there. And if you go that way, then you expose yourself to attack from the Western Mediterranean. We often talk about the value of the Italian position in sitting in the middle of the Mediterranean. Their capabilities, their firepower, the fact that they have such a presence that can solidly block trade going east-west and west-east. But there's also a vulnerability in it. If they concentrate their fleet to deal with the British in the east, then the French in the west are left to play. If they concentrate their fleet to fight the French, then who knows what the Royal Navy will get up to. Neither is a good scenario. Basically, the Italians' war plan has to be to keep the British and the French from A, coming together and combining fleets to attack the centre, and B, to try and deal with them when they're on their own without the other one doing something. Again, this is where speed does come as an apparent advantage. Apparent advantage being, well, we can move from one side to the other, so surely that should make it viable. Not really. You see, speed to manoeuvre between these two positions, between the east and west, creates an illusion of power creates an illusion of capability, because in theory you can move your ships from east to west and they can quickly cover the rolls. In reality, if they've just been fighting a battle, let's say, in the west against the French and driven the French off and won that battle, well, hey, they're going to be damaged. There's very little likelihood of them getting it through it without damage. And they're going to need to resupply and they're going to need to refit fix things which have gone wrong. This means they're not going to be in a fit state to charge east and face off against the British. If they do, it's a good way to throw away all your ships. But the Italians were in the same catch-22 as everyone else. The Washington, London, naval treaties. They're in that catch. And so, they went for this. Which resulted in the French going for this. Which resulted in Italians going, we need to defend this with this. Meet the Capitani Romani class. Named after great Roman generals. Of course not Julio Cesare, that's a, ca a capital ship which seems to live a charmed life and get protected by the Italians far more than anything else, but... Mm. These ships are fundamentally supersized destroyers. How can I say that? Well... If you thought 5.25 inch was an interesting armament to pick for your ship's guns, these are armed with 5.3 inch, aka 135 millimeter. Mm. 
what that point zero five inch gives you an advantage I have no idea but I honestly think in any fight between one of these and a Dido the Dido would smash it mainly because the Dido actually had armor this thing would probably try to accelerate as fast as it could away from a Dido which is not unlikely the Dido maxes out of roughly 32 and a half 32 knots depending on the ship but and this vessel of course does go on till well 41 knots and could do 4350 nautical miles at 18 knots which does make them a very fast cruiser but that's of course as long as they can do the top speed if they're caught at anything like within gun range they're in trouble if they're caught at night they're in trouble They are well-designed hulls, which are might as well be made from paper mache as they are from steel, going up against the things they're going up against. But what's really great is that none are actually sunk. Which is a quality to their construction, because whilst they haven't got armour, and they can therefore take a lot of... Uh, be very easily damaged, they are actually built with quite a lot of subdivision inside, which means they do stay afloat. As discussed, their dimensions are, well, displacements, 3,745 tonnes in standard, 5,420 tonnes fully loaded. Length 142.2 meters, beam 14.4 meters, draft 4.1 meters. Four water tube boilers supply two geared steam turbines to turn a 110,000 shaft small shaft horsepower into a top speed of 41 knots or a range of 4,315 nautical miles at 18 knots. Complement 418 crew. Sensors and processing systems. Yes, they carried the Guffo radar. Armament for twin 135mm, that's 5.3 inches. Makes sense as a millimeter, not as an inch. Eight single 37mm, doesn't really make sense in any language. 40mm sounds much better. Eight 20mm in four twin mounts. Mm -hmm. Eight 533mm torpedo tubes into quadruple launchers. So basically, they have eight 135mm guns, eight 37mm guns, eight 20mm guns, and eight torpedo ships. Torpedo tubes. This ship really is the 888. Apart from, then they go up to say they have up to 70 mines. You know, they were committed to eights right up until it got to the mines. Would it have absolutely wrecked their plans to accommodate another 18 mines? Considering how often these vessels are involved in mining operations, surely it would have been useful to have another 18 mines. And then it would have been 8, 8, 8, 8, and 88. Okay, I'll stop the jokes about the eights, but seriously... That's actually a well-balanced armament. But here is the armor. And at this point, this is when you know you're dealing with a destroyer, which has been super... Uh, a, a cruiser which has been sort of... Well, a destroyer which has been supersized more than a cruiser. Turrets between 6 and 20 millimeters of armor. What is 20 millimeters of armor going to do? Conning tower, 50 millimeters. Okay. I know one of my normal descriptions of ships is conning tower, waste of weight, waste of displacement. But is anyone really going to stand there and tell me that 50 millimeters of armor is worthwhile putting on a ship for a conning tower? How is that going to give you any more blast protection? 
Because it's certainly not giving going to give you penetration to protection. Here they are in their, far, their design. As you can see, they have mine rails along the outside of the hull. On the deck. That's where they store their 70 mines. Again, an extra nine each side. I think there's, there's plenty of space. You know, you just maybe lengthen the hull a bit. Just a tad. But their engines do take up a huge amount of space. These ships are massively built around their engines. You can also see where the torpedo launchers are. They're built so they can fire eight either side. Again, this is a very much a large destroyer. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually kind of sensible. But the thing is, they're called a cruiser. And that's where you get a problem. Because if they're a cruiser, then they're matching in against a cruiser. And again, if I compare them to what is possibly my least favourite. Definitely my least favourite Royal Navy cruiser. I am... Um, Never going to be a fan of a Dido class. Never. Their armour. Belt, 3 inches. Deck, 1 inch. Magazines, 2 inches. Bulkheads, 1 inch. That ship is not going to be a fun thing for them to fight. Okay, yes, it's armed with 133mm guns. Which, theoretically, means it's at a slight disadvantage. And it only has six torpedo tubes. But it's actually armoured. It actually has some survivability built into it. And the thing is, the Dido class start coming into service, well, they're laid down in 1937. The Capitani Romani class are laid down in 1939. If you ever want proof that these nations were not preparing for war and not ready for war, you have the fact that Italy lays down three new cruisers. Actually, not even three. They lay down the Giglio, uh, Giglio Germanico in April 1939. They lay down the Attilio Reggio, the Pompeo, Pompeo Magno, the Scipio Africon, the Caia Maro, the Claudio Drusto, the Claudio Temperio, uh, the Ottavino Augusto, and the Upio Tranio in September 1939, and then in October 1939 they add in another three. And these ships are not bad ships. You can see that from the fact they are taken up after war. The Attilia Reglo becomes the Chateau Renault, or serving with the French. So does the Cipia Africana add up and they're going up there. This is what it looks like in service. They become fast, capable destroyers. Because that's what they are. Although it is noticeable that she rebuild for quite a long time before the French yards let her out. Um, she's acceded to France in 1947 and she's finally commissioned in 1948. And then is rebuilt between 1951 and 1954. Not decommissioned until 1961, so, you know, spends three years, three, four years being rebuilt, and then serves for another seven years. That's economical. Now, 
named for Marcus Attilia Regnus, who was consul in 267 and 256 BC, and commander of the Battle of Cape Econus versus the Carthaginians, and of course I've done that battle on this channel. It is a good ship. Its service in World War II is a little truncated. How do I mean? Well, it's commissioned in August 1942, then torpedoed in November 1942 by HMS Unruffled. Yes, one of those Royal Navy U-class submarines. They get everywhere. She then spent several months having her bow sh uh, repaired because it had been shattered. Unlike with HMS Eskimo, the Rage Marina will not operate on a system of Quick, quick, quick! It's expanded its bow! In place a new one! We're ready to go. We have a ready we have a ready to go bow supply for the expendable bows. Nope. She was then interned in Port Mahon after the armistice took place in sort of nineteen forty three. Um And then in 1947, she's part of the peace treaty. She's transferred over to France as part of reparations. So she basically gets no war. She's laid down in 1939. She's launched in 1940. She's commissioned in May 1942. And, well, May, August 1942. And she is... By November 1942, pretty much out of the war. But long enough that by the time it comes to the armistice, she's in turn in Spain. The San Giorgio class destroyers are what serve with the Italian Navy. The thing about the vessels that were sort of their name for, the well, that they replace, Pompeo Magno and Gilio Germanic, is these vessels are laid down in 1939. They're launched in July and August 1941. And then they are scuttled. Well, in the case of um, Giro Germanico is captured by the Germans in Casamere de Stavia. While it's almost about to be completed, it's scuttled by them on 28th of September 1943. It's raised and then completed for the Italian Navy after the war and renamed San Marco. Serving as a destroyer leader, ish vessel, until 1971. Pompeo Magno, well, yeah. Otherwise known as the San Dorio. Entered the service actually with the Rage Marina just before Armistice. It was then removed from the Navy list, but in 1950 it was chosen for reconstruction. And then it entered service in 1955. It was only eventually finally disarmed in 1980. They served a long time, and they were useful vessels in their roles, but they didn't get completed, so we can't really consider them as part of this class for our purposes. And, by the way, the vast majority of the class did not get completed. Four vessels out of a planned 12 are actually completed. The others are, well, four more are actually launched, but Ulupio uh, Trenio is sunk by a British human torpedo attack whilst it was fitting out in Palermo. Um, Octavia, Ottaviano Augusto is captured by the Germans in Ancona while under completion, sunk by air attack. 
Cornelia Silla is captured by the Germans in Genoa uh, whilst it was fitting out and sunk in an air raid in July 1944. And Caio Maro, captured by the Germans in La Spezia with only the hull completed. It was used as a floating oil tank and scuttled in 1944. The others, well, Claudia Druzzo, cancelled in June 1940. Claudio Tiberno, cancelled in June 1940. Paolo, Paolo Emilio, cancelled in June 1940. And Vispanio Vizania Agrippa, cancelled in June 1940. All cancelled. By the Italians. They had literally started these ships in 1939 and they were cancelling them in 1940 by June 1940. Let's be honest, having some large destroyer-like ships would have been quite useful for the Italians later in the war. If they'd actually had the infrastructure and industry to build these ships, they would have been very, very useful for them. Scipio, uh, Scipio Africano is, of course, named for the famous victor over the Carthaginians. And you would be quite easily excused for thinking that this is the only vessel of the class which actually matters. Because in war terms, she's the only one which really fights. And when I say fights, I mean fights a lot. She managed to serve... Well, she's technically the 10th member of her class, but she actually managed to get fit, built, fitted out, and completed. She enters service on the 23rd of April, 1943. She's then assigned to the Fleet Destroyer Group upon entry. Took part in exercises in May 1943, where they're trying to work out how they're going to better use the ships they have and deal with the new technology they've got. Yes, you still exercise in wartime. She's then sent to reinforce the squadron at Toronto. This was how decided in July. The idea being that um, she would help the, for the help the forces repel any potential threat of the Allies jumping from Sicily to Italy. During this operation, life didn't go well for her. Life did not go well for her. She bumped into motor torpedo boats. She was equipped with the Guffo radar, as been said, and detected four British Elko motor torpedo boats lurking roughly five miles ahead during the night of... 17th July 1943. This was while passing the Messina Straits. She was travelling at high speed. Very high speed. She managed to sink MTB 316 and MTB 313, which she heavily damaged, between Reggio de Cabana and Bellana. The engagement lasted less than 150 seconds, it seems. And definitely not three minutes. Suffering herself, minor damage, and two injuries among its crew. When German and Italian artillery batteries, deployed along the coast, decided to open fire because they'd seen an engagement going on and they presumed the victor must be the, other, the Allied powers, not the Italians. She reached Taranto. Now, she was assigned to the Taranto light cruiser group alongside Pompeo Magno and light cruiser Luigi Candona, of course, the Condottieri. And their purpose was to try and discourage what the Allies might do post Sicily. Mm hmm. They laid minefields in the Gulf of Taranto, the Gulf of Squillance, 
and we're doing a lot of work such as that. No, and that's sort of the, the ter wartime deterrent operations. We're going to make doing any operation very, very difficult. In 1943, of course, though, September, the armistice of Casabile is announced, and Italy decides to switch sides, basically. On 9th of September, Scipiano Africano is ordered to head to the north into the Adriatic to Pescara to evacuate the heads of government. She managed to run into some German S boats, Chanel boats, which had mm, fled Taranto the prior evening. They made smoke and decided to run away before the cruiser could engage. It's interesting to realize that war starts almost immediately upon the announcement um, between the Italians and the Germans. They start fighting pretty much get go on both sides. She made Pescara shortly after midnight, but found that the charges, or rather her would-be charges, had already left aboard the Bayonetta, a Corvette. Africano reverse course caught up the Corvette, which had also taken Vittorio Emmanuel III, that's the king, and his family aboard, at 0700 hours next day, and escorted them to Brinzi. They drove off a Luftwaffe air attack during the on the way. So again, the guns proved very useful. In Sept then 29th of September 1943, she departed Brinzi for Malta, carrying aboard her Marshal Bagdolio, the guy who was sort of functioning as the effective head of government, um, arrived at Valletta the same day, and then Bagdolio signed the terms of, long of the long armistice aboard the British aboard HMS Nelson. which was basically confirmation of what was already happening, that the Italians were going to leave the fighting war on the German side and switch to fighting on the Allied side. And then she spends the rest of the war fighting alongside Allied ships. And this is one of the things I do find interesting. She's one of the hardest fighting vessels. And then the Italians sign her over to the French... It's sort of a case of, yes, have this ship we have worked into the ground. Where it becomes the Gushen. What's interesting is, then she's fitted with three, no, six in three twin mounts. 105mm guns, which were formerly German guns, um, 10 Bofors 57mm autocannons in five twin mounts, and um, four triple torpedo tubes launchers. A crew does go down though. So, these ships. Well, this is where you get into an interesting discussion. Because the Italian Navy had produced what are arguably some of the most balanced, well designed destroyers of World War II. The trouble is, they're not called destroyers, they're called cruisers. Which, apart from illustrating the folly of the treaties, even more so does make some other issues viable to be seen. These ships are very capable, they're very fast, although not necessarily the speed is needed. But they're also kind of one-shot ships. If you had had more in service during the war, they would have run up against British destroyers. They would have run up against British cruisers far more often. They would have actually probably engaged in fighting with them. And this is their weak point, because they can run away, true. But they're a battle cruiser without the crushing guns. The battle cruiser's advantage is that anything which fights it, it can damage. Even a capital ship, it can damage. 
as good as 135mm guns are, they ain't gonna damage a ship which is properly armoured for dealing with 8 inch guns. Or a ship which is a capital ship. Yes, that's what they have their 8 torpedoes for. But there again, these ships are very big as a destroyer at the time. They are very big as a destroyer at the time. And relying on their torpedoes to take on a capital ship, they're big enough they might justify main, uh, main caliber engagement. They're definitely going to get the full attention of the secondaries. And they've got no armor. What does this mean for them? This means that whilst they can definitely, in theory, attack these things and be a viable threat against them, they are also, also, going to fundamentally be quite weak. Because they get hit enough, they're not going to be in service. Again, I remind you, though, that a vessel did survive losing its, its bow to a torpedo, which is good. That shows that their subdivision is working well, their damage control is there, and they have an elegant capability. But, this is the thing you have to remember, that's not enough to win a battle. That's enough to survive it. And you actually have to win battles to try and win a war. You do. So we've got to come up. Next week we have a solo class. This week, we have Patron 66, Michael 66, Washington Cheaties. And next, in 24th, we have Patron 67, Michael 66, are in use of water based armor. So, it appears <clears throat> that we have a first ever occurrence. Same person has won both points, both, I don't know, questions. So, yeah, Michael, 66. Your suggestions won. They got 16 and 13 votes equally. There were three more which received 12, two which received 11, and four which received 10, from memory, of suggestions. Which shows it was a hard-fought contest, really. And a good one. So I look forward to doing those. All this coming up. Well, it's going to be good, hopefully. Hopefully you'll enjoy it all. I am editing and building and doing all sorts of things to try and make sure I have enough time to do all the things I can do to get all these done. I hope you enjoyed them all. It's going to be a fun Christmas. Thank you very much everyone for watching. hope you enjoyed. hope you found this video interesting. and hope you found the Italian cruisers interesting. I would like to have spent more time talking about operations and things these ships did, but honestly they didn't manage to do much. They did a few little bits, but by the time they entered the war, the Italians, while still as brave and as active as ever, were just not in the place to do more than they were doing because they didn't have the resources to do it. There was a real lack of resources. A fundamental problem with the Axis is that there was always as much of a tension between partners as there was with their opponents. It was always an alliance of convenience that worked for them at the time. It was only incredibly foolish people who thought it would last forever. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed and take care.